So flight, it's a subject that has inspired millions of people for probably hundreds of thousands of years. To be able to look up and wonder what it'd be like to be one of these birds, having that complete three-dimensional space, not being tied down by this invisible master of ours as gravity, I don't probably need to really describe any more of the reasons to be inspired by, uh, by flight. Now, to be clear, we as a species have made pretty good progress in the last hundred years. I'm not, uh, not going to claim that uh, you know, we're, we're uh, lacking when it comes to flight vehicles. Now, when it, when it comes to my personal motivation and, and I suppose inspiration behind flight, then you can probably trace that back some 25 years to what I did really with my late father, which was spending a lot of time flying model aircraft, model gliders, chucking these little things off uh, hillsides. And I suppose in hindsight, it only really dawned on me in the last few years, that probably have a, did have a very deep impact on me. Now, wind the clock 25 years further forward, a career in the oil industry for 16 years, a startup founder that was, was quite successful, um, six years in the Royal Marines Reserve as well. I kind of like a challenge. And I hatched this idea really out of, I suppose, a, a passion for human capability that could you reimagine flight? Could you start with a very different philosophical point of view of actually augmenting the human mind and body. And there's a nice little clip here of my old uh, training partner uh, from London. Oh, here we go. Uh, that if, if you could augment that machine, that very elegant balance control system, which is a human body, could you augment that with just the right amount of technology and approach flight in that way, rather than put a human being inside a flight vehicle? It's a subtle difference. And, and to be really clear, we started on this journey alongside a day, you know, it was mostly me, starting alongside a day job for the pure joy of the challenge. And what I'm about to show you is ground zero. And this was around March 2016. And to be really clear as well, we had an absolutely ruthless philosophy of learning from safe failure. And I'm not just giving that lip service. This was starting in a lane in the UK with a micro gas turbine. The fuel tank was in a mop bucket. The throttle control was a funny little knob on the side. That was an aluminum tube with a piece of wood in it for the hand grip. And uh, it was deeply compelling. That little engine weighs about five pounds and puts out 50 pounds of thrust. So there's only obviously one course of action, having had some fun with that. Go and get another one. So there you can start to see, I mean, already we've advanced away from the mop bucket with a fuel tank in. It's now in a, in a backpack on my back. That little clip of me trying to hold the engines out, that's not 100 pounds of thrust, which is fine when you point it down. It's quite manageable. When you point it sideways, it's, it's another thing. So that worked really well, and already we dismissed quite a number of the almost half a dozen assumptions that any sensible aeronautical engineer, of which my entire family background from that, that area, any sensible aeronautical engineer would tell you, before we'd gone and done what we've done, that the 120,000 RPM um, uh, gyroscopic effect of the spindles would create such instability when you try to manipul manipulate and move those around that it would be unworkable. Or maybe that you couldn't carry enough fuel, that the heat would be unmanageable, you'd never be able to actually um, kind of add these to your person without all, sort of, all, without all sorts of terrible injuries and things. Actually, already we've dismissed that. And this is about a month in, in, in our R&D journey. And we didn't really stop there. So now we've got four. So th this is now 200 pounds of thrust. Unfortunately, you're adding weight of equipment, so there's a, there's a, the, the trajectory of the, the body weight ver or the flight system weight versus thrust is in the right way, but you can see we're, we're starting to get there. Now, we then progressed onto the idea of sticking engines on the legs. After all, the, the legs are load-bearing members, so you'd think that would be a sensible idea. Less sensible was the tether. So the, the tether I thought would be a good idea, but it didn't work very well at all. Essentially, it created a fifth vector. I'm already trying to manage four vectors of thrust, and then I've got this weird one between my shoulder blades that keeps yanking me around in different places. So it didn't really work, so we didn't bother with tethers after that. I, I accepted the risk of falling a couple of feet. Th th this was a ludicrous idea as well. We, we spent most of the time trying ludicrous things, which is very much in line with what Peter said earlier. The, the whole journey was ludicrous until a point I'll show you shortly. This is like 300 pounds of thrust, uh, it's just unmanageable. Uh, and you might note as well, there's some bizarre things on my shoulders. That was an attempt to try and keep the batteries out of the heat swirling around my leg area, so we just strapped them to my shoulders. Um, it wasn't a great look. Now, the, the model we kind of landed on, uh, to pardon the pun, was uh, having two engines on each arm and one on each leg. And you can see the steps we were going through here to try and refine this and try and evolve it. You can see tantalizingly close, the legs do weird things, though, with, with engines attached to them. Uh, we were getting very, very close. And this is very much in that realm that Peter talked about around being kind of crazy. You know, every, crazy, every, every breakthrough idea is crazy until it works. Well, what I'm going to show you now is still absolutely 
my favorite slide. It is a very fuzzy little clip of the very first time, only some eight months after that first engine in a lane, that we actually managed to do what we set out to do. That was the moment. That was a six second flight with six gas turbines attached to a human body. And ever since then, all we've gone and done is refined the system. So that was around November 2016. And there's a nice little uh, sequence here. This was actually when we set a Guinness World Record for the fastest speed in a body controlled jet suit. It's the best kind of record to set or break because there wasn't one before. So that was kind of uh, an easy, easy challenge. Uh, so we spent a fun day ch flying around this lake. This is quite some time ago now. Now, what you'll notice as well is that we've shifted the flight system from that very first rudimentary flight. We realized that if you start moving those leg engines up the body and put them around the waist, you solve a lot of problems. I used to destroy any ground pretty much I trod on with those engines so close to the ground, whereas up here it didn't cause a problem. Also, we had some amusing instances where the engines would, would actually ingest the exhaust from the arm engines into the, into the intakes, and you just instantaneously melt all the blades out. You'd only see it if you replay the GoPro footage, you see a little puff of sparks, and that was your, the innards of your engine departing. So that wasn't really very helpful. So by, by putting them up around the waist, that really helped, and then eventually we consolidated them to one larger engine, which still maintains this kind of tripod, camera, uh, tripod of thrust, uh, but is a much better system. Now, we, that was around, uh, the, the, the first flight was around November 2016. We then went through the winter of refining the system and started to plot this idea of, well, you know, I wonder whether the small number of people that we'd actually shown this to we, would seem to be deeply impressed and, uh, and quite inspired by what we'd done. So we thought, well, I wonder if we go and share this more widely with the world. So we planned to launch it in, t uh, it was around April 2017. And we did a launch video with Wired and Red Bull to try and help nudge it towards the you know, pioneering step of uh, human aviation rather than the you know, ludicrous attempt to blow yourself up, which the British press might be a bit more inclined to go for. So we, we launched it, and within a week, uh, I got a call from Chris Anderson to go and do TED, which was very flattering and uh, also horrifying because he said, could you fly it there? And we hadn't done any public events at all at that point, so I thought that really is a, well, I want to say something or bust uh, opportunity. Uh, and it, we, we, I got all the equipment together, we went to go and do the event, and the last minute, the Drapers, if you uh, see um, uh, Tim Draper up in the top corner of that picture, the Drapers reached out and said, I didn't really honestly know the Drapers at the time, they reached out and said, on the way, could you stop off in San Mateo and do a, do a little demo of this, because this looks like amazing if it's real, because it doesn't even look real. Uh, and I stopped off and did a very short little demo in their car park at the VC open day, and then Tim got out a $100 bill and wrote my VC investment opportunity on the $100 bill, and that was my raise, and I'm still wearing the equipment, because that was about 30 seconds after I landed. And then we went on to TED, and luckily pulled off a flight without crashing at TED. So that was a pretty intense first month of existence of the company. Now, since then, we've done 51 live flight events in 18 countries. It's kind of been seen by millions of people all over the world. And I'm you know, pretty pleased with where we've got to from a, from a capability point of view. Now, having lived the journey of, of setting up a startup some years back, and it, you know, it, was, it was eventually successful, but I know how hard that journey can be, I've been very insistent with this journey that actually we seek that sort of self-validation by actually proving that this not only can be an insane amount of fun, but also generate its own revenue. So we've generated over a million dollars of revenue in the first 15 months of this business as a startup quite a lot from events, but also from this, which is if you so choose, and we've done this with quite a few people now, if you so choose to come and try and learn to fly one of these, and it's now remarkably easy compared to, used, compared to what it used to be, then you can come to our former US Air Base uh, nuclear hangar, uh, it's not nuclear anymore, but it, it used to be in the Cold War, and learn to fly one of these jet suits. And so that's an experiential thing we offer, uh, and it's based just outside of London, but we're looking to broaden this out to lots of other locations. It's all tethered and safely controlled. So you're actually a bit like training wheels on a bike. You can step through this in, in incremental stages until you build up the, the, the stability and confidence. The record so far is five minutes from going from never seeing it before to being able to be taken off the tether and flying around. There is something really spookily uncanny about the ability of the human brain to learn balance. You know, doing that is vastly less stable than what I do vastly less stable. Even just walking around on two feet is less stable. So once you've just kind of tuned your brain into it, it's, it's, it's as I say, surprisingly doable. And I'm also going to announce that a certain Peter is uh, coming to do this on Sunday uh, in LA. We are setting up a kind of lighter touch version of this for him and a few other clients. And he's going to uh, strap on a 1,000 horsepower jet suit and we'll teach him to fly. So uh, we look forward to that. 
And <clears throat> in addition to the events and the flight experiences, we also now, uh, actually, we launched it with Selfridges in London. Uh, some weeks back, we actually offer, and this is a particularly evil looking one, it doesn't have to look that evil. Uh, we actually offer $440,000 1,000 horsepower jet suits for sale, and that one was sold only last week to a New Yorker who's coming out in October to uh, learn to fly that one. So who'd have thought? It's a pretty remarkable business. Now, this is all kind of the focus in the short term. The journey has been around setting a challenge. We set ourselves a challenge. I set myself a challenge, I suppose, to do something that looked patently ridiculous. And talking of patenting as well, actually, we've actually patented all the technology, uh, which is, again, a surprise. The prior art cited in the uh, patent attorney's document, the first item, and there was not very many items on there, was the Marvel creation of Iron Man. So I'm going to get that framed. That was then thrown out. Uh, so we, we've actually gone and achieved, I suppose, and delivered on the original challenge that we set ourselves to go and reinvent, reimagine this form of human flight. But really, we think this is only the very beginning. We're already working on an electric version, which actually, to our surprise, works in a not a bad, you know, it's not bad. And with the advances that are coming in terms of you know, EV technology, we're going to be hoovering that up as we go. We've got a, a wing system, which is, it's, is just outrageously compelling. It allows you to, above about 30 miles an hour, start generating significant lift from a deployable wing system. And then that you can back off the thrust required to hover. You can back that thrust off to even 10% and actually sit on the aerodynamic lift of the wings. So the longevity and um, speed uh, limits, if you like, just go out the window. I mean, it's just it's insane. But really, what we have accidentally opened up, I believe, is now the potential for an entire new dawn of human mobility. We can move people around, like frankly, that dream most people have around flying and being completely free in three-dimensional space. The flight I'll do this evening, again, all being well, normal caveat, it's all worked fine for 51 events, but it's, I always have a respect for the technology. That feeling of actually lifting off the ground and having that complete three-dimensional just freedom to look where you want to go and just go there is like, nothing else anybody's ever experienced. And that's what we want to bring to a bigger audience. Now, how do we accelerate that journey? Race them. So this is a little, little kind of B-roll set of uh, clips. So this was a bit of a laugh. This was just chasing a jet ski. This should be really chasing two other pilots, but at the time, we just had that jet ski. So if you imagine you marry up kind of nighttime Formula One with Red Bull Air Race pylons over water. Water's sensible, because then if you lose it, you just go in the water. The water-triggered life jacket pops up, and you just feel a bit sad about the damage you do to the engines. Um, we've got other pilots. That, that guy in the background, he was a bit of a slow starter. He only took 15 minutes to uh, learn to do that. Uh, and training other especially capable, you know, young athletic people half my age is going to be outrageous. I think we'll really push the boundaries. And this little sequence is designed to paint a little bit more of a picture of what that race series would look like. So you imagine the Bay Area, Singapore Harbor, uh, Dubai. You imagine a bunch of 20-something ex-gymnasts, rock climbers, dirt bike riders, all the suits skinned differently. We 3D print most of the uh, equipment. The arm mounts are some of the biggest single aluminum 3D prints ever done uh, to keep it light and organic. We run a heads-up display system so you could broadcast that live to an audience. You could broadcast that to actually a VR immersive experience in your home. Hell, you could even go cryptocurrency betting on the outcome if you want. So. When, when modern day motorsport, and rightly so, has managed to eliminate so much of the kind of uh, drama and impact of people crashing, we can safely have people losing it, clipping obstacles, spinning out into the water, and it'll look outrageous. So this is where we're going. This is the mechanism by which we accelerate the development of the technology. Through, throughout the last probably several hundred years, every time somebody says, you know, mine's faster than yours, it tends to push the technology. So that's where we're really heading. And as I say, that's going to fuel the journey onto this revolution we believe we can open in terms of human mobility. Now, I, I have, I've, I've got one last thing to kind of offer you. And we haven't shared this with anybody else yet. And I saved it for this, uh, for this stage. We've got so far with this race series plan that we're now willing to reveal that we've got six race team slots available for 2019. And before you get too worried, I'm not suggesting you necessarily have to fly it yourself. Think more Formula One, NASCAR, or GT Cup. You can sponsor, if you want, an individual race team slot. We can find you the pilot. Hell, you can find the pilot if you want. We skin the entire 3D printed suit and a backup in exactly how you want it to be. And you get to enjoy something that will make Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR look pretty dull. And that'll then tour around all of these ridiculous venues. Again, they'll all be water venues. And that's the mechanism by which we then go and accelerate this journey. And I suppose to end it, 
This is a shot of what it feels like, the best I can give you of what it feels like to fly at sunset over Malibu Beach, except there's only me there. And we've got two or several other pilots, and next time we do this, there'll be a, a little mini race going on, and that's the future that we believe we can unlock, and that's the future we'd like to offer you to be part of. Thank you very much.